I'm Elizabeth Angel. I'm the Communications and Program Manager at ERI. Um, welcome to the Quick Quake Briefing hosted by ERI's Northern California Regional Chapter. We're very excited today to be wel welcoming four great speakers to discuss the earthquake that happened on the California-Nevada border this summer. And before I hand it over to today's host and moderator, I want to say a few brief words about EERI. For those who may not be familiar with us, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the large, the leading nonprofit membership organization dedicated to connecting those who are working to reduce earthquake risk. ERI has been bringing people and disciplines together since 1948. And by joining ERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals and also help make events like this possible. Now I'll turn it over to Volkan Sevilgen to tell you a bit more about ERI's Northern California Regional Chapter. Volkan? Thank you, Elizabeth. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our uh, presentations. I'm the uh, Northern California Chapter President of the EERI. And we started the Quick Quick Briefings Program this year. And this is our eighth um, presentation this year. Purpose of this program was to help instigate collaboration among experts around the globe to help uh, solving our local problems. We are dedicated to so, um, helping uh, Northern California earthquake risk and what better way of learning from everybody else than waiting for our own earthquake to strike here. So today I will give the virtual microphone to Donald Wells who would be moderating this great uh, speakers today. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Donald. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce the four speakers that we're going to hear from today. Um, we've assembled a panel of representatives from a number of California and uh, other organizations that uh, uh, have gathered information about this earthquake. Uh, we're going to have Brian Olson, who's an engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey, Austin Elliott, who's a research geologist with the USGS, Rich Kaler, who's an associate professor at the Nevada. Uh, with the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology at uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, and Richard Henninger, who's a senior bridge engineer with Caltrans. Um, they're going to be talking about their observations from actual reconnaissance during the earthquake or information related to the, that's been gathered by the state agencies in response to or in preparation for earthquakes. Um, each of the speakers will tell you a little bit about themselves as, as they start. So I'm going to skip that part and just mention one other logistical thing for today. We've got four speakers, and we don't know that we'll have time for a Q&A session at the end. You're welcome to put questions into the Q&A um, uh, portal on the screen, and we'll, we'll get to them if we can. Otherwise, we'll forward them to the author, authors. But you're also welcome to please take each of the author's email addresses, which they'll provide in their presentation, write that down, and send them your questions directly. Um, with that, I'd like to, to introduce Brian Olson to, to tell us about the earthquake. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, get started on this. Uh, I'll be opening up here, providing a summary. Uh, again, my name is Brian Olson. I'm an engineering geologist with the California Geological Survey. Uh, I am based out of the uh, Southern California Regional Office, which is in Los Angeles. Uh, so a little bit dis distant from this event, but still um, very much interested in it. The, um, so my email, if you need it, is down in the lower left, brian.olson at conservation.ca.gov. So to just begin, I wanna talk about the earthquake sequence in general. This is uh, what everyone's here to talk about. So let's start right away with it. Uh, it was a magnitude uh, 6.0 that happened on July 8th, 2021 in the afternoon. Now uh, on, the, on the right-hand side here is a, a, a um, diagram or figure showing one year of seismicity leading up to and including the magnitude six main shock. And you can see that there was really no appreciable foreshock sequence. There was no robust swarm or uh, you know, moderate magnitude threes and fours that, that were popping off and leading up to this. In fact, uh, for one year, at least in this seismicity here, mo majority of it is focused to the north end up near uh, Topaz Lake along the, along the border of California and Nevada. So um, kind of a you know, interesting tidbit. It was the largest aftershock uh, was was one minute literally after the main shock at a magnitude five. Uh, and then there were other aftershocks in the you know, fours and such along, along the way and, and still happening 
up until recently, but uh, others will will discuss more about that. the The main thing that was uh, that we look for at CGS is the surface effects. So we did notice, uh, and we are aware that there were earthquake induced rock falls that were generated by this earthquake. However, there was no documented surface fault rupture, and there was no documented liquefaction, which are other things. Uh, you know, associated with uh, with moderate size and getting into larger size, you know, six uh, range after uh, main shocks. And so that's interesting. We want to we want to get an idea of what happens in each earthquake. So we want to make sure we document well what's going on. This event, um, while generating, you know, some moderate to even strong ground shaking in the immediate area on the eastern Sierra and the uh, Carson City and uh, and Reno area. Uh, did also produce a significant amount, um, and not significant amount, some weak to uh, shaking, but in significant urban centers on the west side of the Sierra Nevada, notably the Sacramento area and the Bay Area. All of these dots represent reported, um, reported uh, instances of shaking. And uh, so this earthquake, while in a very remote area of Eastern California, did get the attention of a large amount of the Northern California population, as well as uh, those in the uh, Western Nevada area. You can, you can see peak intensities are, are running around uh, uh, six, uh, five to six in the modified Mercalli there on the graph on the left and then taper off with distance uh, understandably. Uh, and then there always seems to be some person out a thousand kilometers away in New Mexico who thinks they felt it. And so they always fill out these things and you always get these rogue ones at the end uh, that are kind of odd, but it has a nice predictable pattern uh, for Western North America with dying off of intensity with distance. So where is this earthquake happening and why is it happening? Well, it's happening mainly here in this basin and range province. Uh, it's a geomorphic province of the uh, North American plate. And it's an area that is a large zone of tectonic extension, which began in the early Miocene. It's a lot of east to west stretching that's going on. It is generally characterized by these uh, roughly you know, parallel uh, normal fault systems that produce these linear uplifted mountain ranges and these linear down drop valleys, hence the name basins and ranges. Uh, and so we generated by extension. Now specifically where we are for this earthquake is a unique area that is uh, called the Walker Lane. And it is kind of highlighted on this figure. It is an area that is a transition zone between the Sierra Nevada uh, geomorphic province to the west, and the and the basin and range, you know, more proper to the east. It is a it is a uh, complex area. A lot of faulting one way, a lot of northwest faulting, a lot of northeast faulting, a lot of north south faulting. We get a lot of strike slip faulting and normal faulting. Uh, strike slip are both right lateral and left lateral. So it's an interesting area uh, as this uh, kind of a, a transition zone in between the two. It is uh, very interesting for a lot of us uh, geologists and seismologists because it accommodates approximately 20% of the relative motion between the Pacific and North American plates. So something on the order of 10 millimeters a year. So this, this is an area that uh, is accumulating uh, strain and uh, is going to be generating some of these larger earthquakes that we've seen here with the 6.0. Uh, uh, and also we know that this area includes the Ridgecrest uh, area, which has, saw a 6.4 and 7.1 in 2019, along with other earthquakes that historically have occurred here. So historically, again, let's look at the area that's more regional and more proximal to where our event was uh, on in July of this year. Uh, historically, we, we have instruments, you know, and stuff area that have been recording here for, let's say, about 50 years or so, maybe a little bit earlier. But historically, you know, we had uh, in the 60s and 70s, there were two of these larger 5.1 and 5.0 earthquakes down in the south. Then in 1994, you can see a large, a large magnitude, a 6.1 that occurred to the north of this area. And uh, so this area is not, is no stranger to these uh, moderate to strong earthquakes. And then we have our uh, main shock from July, 2021, the magnitude six here in the center. Now, again, we, I had talked about how this Walker Lane is an area of transition and it is a complex area of mixed styles of faulting. And so this 1994, for example, the focal mechanism shows that this was a dominantly strike slip earthquake. Uh, whereas in uh, the July, 
our focal mechanism just to the south shows that this earthquake was dominantly dip slip and normal. Uh, so this is showing, giving you an example here in these larger earthquakes that uh, that faulting style is very complex and mixed in this area of, of the Walker Lane. So CGS, you know, the agency I work for for the state, gets involved in mapping these faults. And so we want to know where these faults are. And in 1972, the, uh, the legislature passed what's called the Alquist Priolo Earthquake Fault Zone Mapping Act. Uh, it was passed in response to the San Fernando earthquake of 1971 in Southern California. But the basic idea of the, the uh, act is to, is to document and to produce maps uh, that show where are the surface fault rupturing hazard faults in the state, surface rupture hazards. And then we want to make zones around those so that it becomes zones of required investigation for any future developments. Well, this area of uh, Antelope Valley was evaluated in 1983. Uh, it, at, at that time, the dominant source for, uh, for mapping and evaluating faults were stereo paired aerial photos and topo maps and then field recon. So you can see the level that we have going here and uh, level of detail. So we wanna see that, um, well, I'll highlight some of the notes here. You know, we have things like from the, from the uh, aerial photos, we see possible scarp in talus deposits along the Slinkard Valley Fault here to the west. We have notes from the field saying alluvial fan surface offset. The dip of the, of the scarp is 32 degrees, the slope angle, I should say, and it's a 15 foot high scarp. You know, we're making notes like that. Uh, we have subtle scarps in older alluvium along the eastern Antelope Valley Fault. And all of these things go together to be evaluated for a fault. And for a, for a fault in California to be, a, to be zoned under the AP Act, it has to be sufficiently active and well defined. And so we look at all these things together and all these notes, and we produce a final map. And the final map here found that only the Antelope Valley Fault Zone met those criteria completely. And it was the Slinkard Valley Fault to the west and the Eastern Antelope Valley Fault uh, didn't really, didn't really uh, pan out as far as a surface fault rupture hazard. And as we're gonna see, we're very likely that this earthquake occurred on the Slinkard Valley Fault and yet did not produce surface rupture, which is in, uh, you know, consistent with what we're seeing uh, in the data uh, from the, these photos back in the uh, back in the day. Uh, subsequent to this event, I wanted to talk briefly about CGS's post earthquake response. On July eighth, when this happened, uh, amazingly, uh, DOC's chief scientist and data officer Nate Roth was driving on Highway three ninety five in Walker and ended up having to pull over and did a bit of uh, a bit of recon to uh, find out and see what was going on, actually experienced the earthquake, which was great. But as far as CGS geologists, we were, uh, we, we uh, mobilized a, a two geologists, one from the Sacramento area and one that lived in Truckee or lives in Truckee. And they drove out on the ninth, the morning, and they began a, uh, a traverse uh, from the north, hiking south into Slinkard Valley, uh, walking along the fault. And you can kind of see their red trace there along the, along the Slinkard Valley fault here, right in the center, uh, upper center part of the figure. And they did not find anything fault rupture wise. Uh, on July 10th, the geologist went in from the south and hiked north along the Slinkard Valley fault. And they did find a small rock fall in the valley, uh, and, uh, which we can see here. This is a photo of the, of the, uh, of the boulder. You can see all the the busted up marks on the side where it had uh, tumbled down the slope and come to rest. So it has its recent bruises and everything. But um, that, that was kind of about it in, in the valley itself. Uh, also, the uh, geologists received interferograms that were coming in the next day from people and these really nice how the digital community works together to get people in the field, the information that they need. And the interferograms were not showing really any evidence that we should be expecting surface rupture, which was consistent with the observations that were made in the field. Uh, July 11th, the, uh, both geologists continued working and they conducted a UAV flight over a large rockfall that was uh, documented in the KOA campground north of Walker. And they continued a methodical inspection in the Antelope Valley, which is the large valley um, where Walker is and where the Antelope Valley fault zone was mapped. And they walked also along the Walker River and they found no evidence of liquefaction, no evidence of any failures along the riverbank from shaking. And so Brian, the summary of what was observed by these people up. was- A couple oh, minutes. Um, 
Okay, Rockfall uh, on Highway 395, which I'm sure we'll see the fun videos of in a second. Rockfall at the uh, KOA property and a small rockfall in Slinkard Valley. So the quick summary is that this July 8th, 2021, six earthquake occurred in the Northern Walker Lane, which is a transitional zone between the Sierra Nevada and the Basin and Range. This area also has generated a magnitude 6.1 earthquake in 1994. So this is, uh, this is not unexpected, and we should expect that this area will continue to produce six uh, magnitude six earthquakes. Um, the magnitude six in 2021 generated moderate shaking locally and was noticeably felt in Sacramento and the Bay Area. And post-event field observations by CGS and others showed that the earthquake generated a, some scattered rock falls, but really there were no surface fault ruptures observed and no liquefaction effects observed. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, great to hear about the, uh, all the effects. Next, we're going to hear from Austin Elliott from the U.S. Geological Survey talking about the seismological and ground shaking effects and uh, USGS monitoring programs for earthquakes. Hi everyone, thank you Donald and thanks everyone for uh, inviting me to speak to you today uh, and attending here to hear about uh, this earthquake from the USGS perspective. Uh, I'm a research geologist at the Earthquake Science Center in Moffett Field. Uh, any questions uh, or comments that you have that you'd like to get in touch, uh, my email is there on the screen or you can look me up um, with a search. I'll show it again at the end. So what I'm going to do today is just uh, sort of walk through the details uh, about this earthquake, essentially based on kind of contextualizing and diving into depth, each of the various products that you find on the USGS event page, um, which is one of the main sources that we go to for information about these uh, events. And there's a lot of interesting stuff that's assembled here. I want to kind of put it in context and bring it together as a summary of this fairly significant event. Uh, Brian already gave the introduction. We know it happened on the afternoon of July 8th. It was widely felt across Northern California and Western Nevada. Um, the, uh, it was a normal faulting event. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, as we go on uh, um, regarding the specific faults involved and how we know about this. Um, uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, within a minute of the earthquake, there was a magnitude, a large magnitude aftershock, and it's a fairly poorly constrained earthquake because it's involved in, in um, it's sort of lost in the coda of the, the main event. Um, but for the most part, what everyone recognized widely across the region was this magnitude six earthquake. Uh, I want to put it in some broader context of the major earthquakes that have, or the large earthquakes that have happened in California and Nevada in uh, the last 50 years. So what I'm mapping out here, you can see in red are sort of the major earthquakes. That's magnitude 6.5 and above. These are the ones that people really know the names of, right? Loma Prieta, Northridge, the Ridgecrest earthquakes from two years ago, uh, last year's Monte Cristo Range earthquake. Uh, and then going back a little while, this sort of smaller end, a little more remote, we had Coalinga and the San Simeon earthquake. Uh, the rest of the earthquakes that are marked on here are magnitude six and above since 1977. And there's quite a smattering of them around the state. And these ones, they, they get a little bit more lost in the, in the sort of public and historic consciousness, unless you're really local, um, right? Because their impacts are, are relatively limited. Uh, but there are a handful of them. They happen several times a decade, um, or at least there's a representative one each decade uh, all across the state. So we had the Napa earthquake um, in 2014, uh, the Parkfield earthquake and the series of those that preceded that. Um, in 1984, there was a Morgan Hill earthquake, magnitude 6.2 in the South Bay area. Uh, and then where this earthquake occurred in the Eastern Sierra, there's similarly this sort of handful, it's something of a representative kind of quake that we've seen here a lot. Um, in 1980, there was a particular spate of basically magnitude six to 6.1 earthquakes around Mammoth. Um, and there was a larger one in 1986, Chalfont Valley. Uh, in any case, this is uh, basically not an unexpected earthquake. And it's uh, just to highlight that these do pop off periodically around the state. Um, and uh, other than locals, they'll tend to get forgotten, uh, I think, um, by the general public. This earthquake in particular, uh, as Brian mentioned, it happened uh, probably on the Slinkard Valley Fault. Uh, it 
The epicenter is here beneath the Antelope Valley near the town of Walker and the smaller town of Colville. You know, if you ever drive over Monitor Pass, Highway 89, this beautiful drive as you come down the front of the Sierras, um, just south of Topaz Lake on the border, uh, you'll be familiar with the really dramatic mountain front that you drive by as you head south toward the Walker River. And that's basically exactly where this earthquake was centered. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, or maybe toward the end of this presentation, the main rupture uh, seems to have occurred actually not on that main mountain front, but on this sort of subsidiary perched back, uh, you know, farther west structure, the Slingard Valley Fault, that forms a mountain front in its own right. Um, and uh, we'll hear more about the geology of that in the next presentation. Uh, and I'll, I'll point out some more evidence that we have that that was the fault activated in this event. As we can see, the um, one of the products the USGS produces is a, a slip inversion for the slip at depth on the fault. What you can see here is the uh, a view of the fault plane with uh, magnitude of slip and the direction of slip indicated here as resolved onto the fault. The, the hypocenter was 7.5 kilometers depth, and the rupture was something like 15 kilometers long and about half that much in depth. Uh, of course, this is relative to the geoid. So here in the Eastern Sierra, you've got sort of an additional kilometer and a half to two kilometers of elevation uh, uh, above that. So uh, this helps illustrate why no surface rupture was, uh, uh, this earthquake didn't produce surface rupture on the fault. Um, just to point out, everyone's always curious about the did you feel it data. It's sort of the, the connection that people have to the event. Uh, and so far, this is a very widely reported uh, earthquake. It's got one of our highest tallies for the number of responses. Uh, as of yesterday, it was 25,974. So we're 26 shy of 26,000 events. Uh, if anyone in the audience felt this earthquake or not, uh, and lives in the region and hasn't submitted a felt report, maybe you can push us over the 26,000 mark. Uh, the main point is that near the epicenter, there were intensities of about six. Uh, they were damaging. There was um, uh, things fell off shelves and there were broken glass and stuff in the town of Walker. Uh, but more broadly, it was felt relatively noticeably, but weakly around the rest of the region, including in um, Sacramento and the Sierra foothills in particular, uh, as well as the Eastern Sierra and towns like Reno. Uh, nearer the coast, it was hit or miss whether you felt it. And because we had such distance, uh, people tended to only feel it if they were in sort of larger buildings or particularly sensitive to the low frequency waves that, that made it that far. I'll talk more about that uh, at the end of the presentation. Again, this is just rounding out the did you feel it data also contributes to the overall shake map, which is uh, largely based on actual instrumental measurements. You can see the shake map here, as well as a plot of the uh, peak ground accelerations. And the triangles represent seismic instruments and the dots are uh, converted intensity measurements. So translated into um, uh, ground peak ground acceleration based on some um, relational formulas. Um, what you, it follows basically a predictable pattern. It's not a very surprising event. Um, one notable feature of it may be that there are sort of higher accelerations in the Central Valley. As you get into the um, basin sediments here, you get essentially a, a step up in the accelerations uh, from, from the regular contours here. So you cross this boundary here and suddenly you're back into higher accelerations like you had closer to the epicenter. So that accounts for some of these um, uh, higher measurements above the curve here. Uh, conversely, you have uh, lower accelerations and, and milder shaking up in sort of the, the bedrock peaks uh, in the Sierras. Um, from the distribution of shaking, a variety of products are produced that estimate the exposure to various risks from the earthquake, including the risk of shaking, of course, but there are um, the secondary impacts can be significant. And in fact, that was one of the main effects of this earthquake, other than general regional uh, weak shaking. Uh, the USGS estimates ground failure hazards, including both landsliding and liquefaction. Uh, the liquefaction hazards were very low, um, were estimated to be very low in this event, but there was some uh, predicted hazard of landslides. 
Uh, we'll actually look at the map in detail here and you can see uh, this is essentially uh, the shake map, so the particular shaking of this earthquake convolved with the susceptibility to landsliding that's calculated from independent metrics in the terrain. And um, you can see that there are some hot spots here, which do and which lie along basically the steep mountain faces of the eastern Sierras, and they do in fact correspond to known and observed rock falls. So um, the map has actually performed pretty well at identifying locations where uh, th there was mass wasting of some kind. Um, this is uh, right here at uh, Sentinel, Centennial Bluff outside the KOA campground in Colville. That's the really famous steep mountain front that you'll drive by. And then there's this famous video from uh, the, along the Walker River Gorge. Wait, it's the whole thing. And people driving by. Oh yeah. Uh, going on? Noticed oh, no. all of a sudden there was Look at the other side. Over. Look at the other side. It gradually dawns on them that this wasn't What's happening? What do you see? Is it, is it just a dirt slide? Wow, I don't know what's going on. Oh, it was an earthquake. Huh? It was an earthquake. How do you know? Because the, the, the tires went a little funny. I thought, oh, maybe the road was just funny. It kind of wiggled. I thought, oh, maybe it was just the road. It was well, it's, it's an earthquake. An earthquake so there, you, hit the, you hear them uh, putting the pieces together and recognizing that all the landsliding they saw there was uh, because of the actual ground shaking. Um, in the earthquake. So that illustrates the effects of the of the event and that was the predominant damage. Some of those rock falls landed on the highway. You may have seen pictures and videos of that. Um, Rich Kaler in the next presentation may be talking a little bit about the hydrological effects of the earthquake, but in general, this wasn't a, a, a liquefaction was not really a strong um, risk here, uh, nor a widely observed effect. Uh, one of the last I things I want to, great. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is, um, shake alert because uh, this earthquake did activate the oh, yeah. shake alert system. Uh, although like other recent earthquakes near the border of the shake alert region, this event presented challenges at the periphery of the network. So the system was triggered and alerts were sent out. Shake alert split this magnitude six earthquake into three events at different locations, a 4.8 near Mono Lake, a 4.8 near Stockton, and a 4.3 near Mammoth Lakes. This resulted in under alerting. The area actually alerted by cell phone apps was smaller than the area that should have been. Um, wireless emergency alerts were not issued because none of these events exceeded the magnitude, none of the uh, detected detections of events exceeded the magnitude 5.0 threshold. So the sort of inaccurate performance in this event was caused by several factors. The primary reason is a lack of station coverage in the epicentral area. This is at the periphery of the uh, covered area uh, for shake alert at the California Nevada border. Um, the, uh, 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 let's see, sorry, let me slip, yeah. A um, uh, map of the nearest shake alert seismic stations and the recorded waveforms illustrates what the shake alert system registered and how. There were only six stations within 100 kilometers of the epicenter. Two of these stations actually triggered on a small foreshock nine seconds before the main event, leading to discrepancies in the calculated origin time and location. Beyond those six stations, uh, there's this cluster of um, uh, instruments around Mammoth Mountain and Long Valley Caldera. These resulted in a new shake alert solution for an event near Mono Lake because of the similar arrival times. So over here, the, the network is not 100% built out and each case like this results in a review of processing algorithms to resolve the novel artifacts that result from a combination of event location and station distribution. Um, just to show, these are the events that were sent out here on the left. This is what the uh, the alerts. This is what the alert would have looked like if the magnitude six had been registered accurately. A magnitude six has a um, an intensity uh, three radius of about three hundred fifty kilometers. So it would have alerted uh, a really large number of people, many of whom didn't necessarily feel the earthquake very strongly. And the last slide I have to show you uh, is just the aftershocks since the earthquake happened. Um, you can see they've been dying down in a pretty standard regular pattern. There were a couple large late aftershocks that triggered their own sequences. Uh, but what I'd really like to point out is that while uh, most of them are concentrated over here on the causative fault, 
of the co-seismic rupture, a couple of other planes of interest or, or clusters of aftershocks have appeared in the east. And when you look in cross-section view, you can see that they actually cluster around probably other structures that are uh, involved and, and are, have been activated by this earthquake sequence, um, in addition to the Slinkard Valley Fault itself, which projects neatly to the surface trace that's observed over here. The final thing I'll leave you with is a recording of this earthquake from San Francisco. This is uh, my living room home seismometer uh, showing the particle motion um, uh, over in the bottom right corner is the map view. And you'll see that uh, our apartment moved up to three centimeters back and forth as the earthquake kicks in. Uh, that's the last thing I have to show. So thank you for the time. And uh, I'll look forward to Rich's presentation next. Thanks very much, Austin. That's pretty neat. The uh, Raspberry Shake recording. It'll pick up in just a second here. That's interesting. There. <laughs> here we go. Now we're Thanks. now we're really feeling it. Uh, well, we watched the uh, dots move around. Uh, Rich Kaler uh, from the University of Nevada in Reno and the Bureau of Mines and Geology is going to tell us more about the uh, the ground effects of the earthquake. They uh, sent teams out to uh, map the uh, the effects of the earthquake. So, Rich. So uh, yeah, thanks for those earlier talks. I covered a few of the instance, uh, information that I don't need to cover. So I just want to start with this photo here. It just shows like um, the range front up behind the Slinkart Valley Fall. I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. So I'm just going to go um, take off from where the prior talks um, ended and go more into um, sort of the regional tectonic uh, setting, what we know about the earthquakes from paleo seismology and um, if I have time at the end, talk a little bit about the clearinghouse operation that was going on. I was actually not um, around during the earthquake. I was on an eighth grade graduation skateboard park trip. So I got that, that phone call um, where uh, my agency ha had to respond. And um, so I was able to basically um, uh, keep track of everything from afar, um, know what the field crews were doing from afar, and work with our earthquake coordinator here in shop to keep the clearinghouse updated. So this photo um, on the upper left is just the rock fall that Brian was talking about. Rock fall was pretty common, but it did close Highway 395 for a while. I'm not gonna talk about the intensity because that's already been mentioned, but this photo on the right is a view to the west of Southern Slinkard Valley. It's the range front. And I want you to just point out that the, um, it does have some tectonic geomorphology like triangular facets and such. So this is located to the west of the main Antelope Valley Fault and was thought to be the source fault of the, of the earthquake. Um, so Brian went over the Walker Lane a little bit. I wanna just go over a few more details in my talk. Um, the Walker Lane is highlighted in the sort of light gray in the yellow stars are the main uh, ruptures from the last couple of years, Ridgecrest in the south, Monte Cristo, range 6.5 from 2020, and then of course the Antelope Valley earthquake here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the geodetic rate of strain accumulation across the region. Um, work by Jane Borman for a PhD here at UNR. Um, there's about 50 millimeters um, per year of right lateral shear that's um, taken up mostly on the San Andreas Fault, but it's distributed over a thousand kilometers um, out into the far uh, Great Basin. Um, the Walker Lane basically just separates the Sierra Nevada from the basin and range topography of, of Nevada. Um, and it's characterized by a lot of different styles of faulting, as, as Brian mentioned, but uh, strike slip, normal, and oblique slip faults. Uh, in general, the, um, about 25% of the plate boundary slip budget is accommodated east of the Sierra in the south, but that diminishes to about four millimeters per year, or about 10% of the plate boundary strain. Uh, in the far northern Walker Lane. Um, there's different reasons for this. Some of the slip is bled off into the basin and range, an unknown amount, um, but also the northern Walker Lane is less developed, has a later um, time of initiation, uh, less cumulative, cumulative slip. So it's just kind of not quite um, ramped up to the speed of the faults further to the south. Um, at the latitude of Antelope Valley here, uh, the GPS measurements indicate that there's about five millimeters per year of slip distributed um, east of the Sierra Nevada across the Walker Lane. So then I want to show some work from Wisnowski 2012. Um, again, here's the Walker Lane, sort of an oblique view on the left. Uh, the purple faults are the southern Walker Lane. 
Um, the red, yellow, and black faults are the central walker lane, and the blue faults are the northern walker lane. So what's interesting here is in the central walker lane, there's a big um, right step in the system from these purple faults out to these red faults in the east. Um, that's known as the mine of deflection and was the area of the Monte Cristo earthquake in 2020. But the other thing to note is all these yellow lines are range bounding faults that bound um, an echelon basins. And so what Wisnowski et al did, and including the basin um, that's Antelope Valley, um, what, what they did is they looked at the geodetic rates across the region. Um, they compared the geologic rates of extension across these faults to geodetic rates of extension. And then also in blue, you probably can't read these, but in these boxes in blue is the uh, geodetic shear across the region. So again, about five millimeters per year of shear across the region. Um, but when you look at the region, there's no strike slip fault. So how is this strain accumulated? Um, bedrock offsets from mountain range to mountain range indicate there's about 30 plus kilometers of cumulative right slip across the region, yet you can't put your finger on a right lateral strike slip fault anywhere in there. Um, and so basically, um, if you sum up the extension rates across this yellow line, um, in the in the bottom there, E to F, um, you get about uh, a little, almost about two millimeters per year of extension, which generally matches the geodetic rates of extension. Yet you have about five millimeters per year of shear across the region. So you're you're not um, um, you're not uh, capturing all of the slip uh, across the region. So where so how is that happening? And so the idea is that shear is accommodated by development of discontinuous and echelon asymmetric normal fault bounded basins, but that doesn't account for all of the slip. And so you have to invoke some kind of vertical axis rotations and perhaps some southwest translation of structural blocks. So in the upper right is a wax model from Brune, um, which shows and it's oriented sort of in the primary shear direction, which shows that these basins do open up when you um, uh, deform it in a right lateral sense. And the triangular shapes of the basins um, is similar to what we see in the landscape today, um, indicating that uh, the slip is diminishing towards the tips of some of these faults. So the Sierra range front is dramatic. So the Sierra range front, um, this is the Genoa fault, um, which is just north of the Antelope Valley. And one of the basins that uh, was Nowski 2012 looked at um, there's about 2,000 um, meters of relief, including the surface relief of the range and then what's buried in the basin. Um, the photo on the lower left is um, uh, the fault plain exposed in a quarry near the town of Genoa. Beautiful triangular facets in this photo in the middle, fault scarp running along the base, uh, Holocene fault scarp. This has been mapped by Romelli et al. and trenched, um, scarps up to 20 meters on some of the older fans. Uh, here's where they trenched this photo on the right. Um, it's about a three meter scarp. Um, so the paleoseismic data indicates there was an event about 2000 years ago, the most recent earthquake about 500 years ago, about three to five meters per event of slip and a vertical slip rate of about 0.4 millimeters per year. And I just show this because it's part of the Sierra range front that is, uh, it continues to the south to Antelope Valley. So Antelope Valley is part of the same system. Paleoseismic work by Alec, Alex Sarmiento et al. in 2011 mapped um, the, the Antelope Valley Fault along the same trend that Brian showed for the AP mapping. Um, they focused on the young uh, alluvial fans and the young scarps, where scarp heights range from 2.4 to 6.3 meters. They trenched one of them across a five meter high scarp and indicate the um, occurrence of an earthquake around 1300 years ago and one older than about 6,000 or so years ago. Uh, interesting thing about that is a little bit older than Genoa, but the recurrence is about the same, a couple thousand years. Um, dip slip displacements on those events were about 3.6 to 3.1 meters, uh, and they estimate a vertical slip rate of 0.7 millimeters per year. And so the, the Antelope Valley earthquake happened kind of in Slinkart Valley, this valley up here behind Antelope Valley. Here's the main Antelope Valley fault, but it has... Um, extensive triangular facets and wine glass canyons um, cutting across the scarp. So generally the relief of the entire Sierra Nevada is sort of a combination of the slip on the Slinkart Valley Fault and the Antelope Valley Fault. Ian Pierce et al. came in later and did some more detailed work on the Walker Fan. So again, this is Antelope Valley and I'll point out 
Um, this little line over here is the Slinkard Valley. And I'll also point out the Slinkard Valley fault has not really been studied. Um, but uh, Pierce et al. came in here and they looked at the Walker fan, which was vertically offset 20 to 30 uh, meters or so. Here's a LIDAR image of it. So they had LIDAR data by this time um, to do some detailed um, offset measurements. Um, they did chlorine 36 cosmogenic analyses on boulders distributed on the fan. So here's the, the geologic map of that same fan up here in the upper right. Um, and they did probab probability density plots of the data, um, displacement and age to estimate a vertical slip rate of about half a millimeter per year. So generally in agreement with some of the pre prior studies. So during the earthquake, like I said, I was on a skateboard trip with my son. And so this is the tracks that were displayed on our clearinghouse website that I was monitoring from afar. Uh, folks that were on the field reconnaissance team, Seth D from our shop, Judy Zacharias and Alex Moreland from TGS, Connie DeMassey, one of my graduate students, Steve Wisnowski and some others probably, but these are the ones that submitted information to us. But these are the tracks that were um, submitted to the clearinghouse. Um, as the reconnaissance was happening in the day, the day of and the day after, the clearinghouse has a sort of a box, a text box that shows the notes um, and photos that can be clicked on from the various locations. I'll note that the Slinkard Valley Fault is generally behind this text box and it doesn't have any tracks in it because folks were not really able to get in, along the main range front of the Slinkard Valley Fault, only in the south and the far north because of locked gates due to um, private ranching land. Um, but no surface rupture was noted as, as Brian uh, talked about. There was, Everybody however- You're at uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, so the primary observed effects, um, I'll go pretty quick on this. Some of these have been shown already, but there was a lot of hydrologic adjustment. Hot springs dried up at a couple ranches um, and springs, new springs began to flow, new riv rivlets uh, flow on these hot, uh, on these dry roads. It's hot and dry in the summer, but these new springs were flowing out on the roads immediately after. A lot of dust clouds in the canyons and the canyon sidewalls. Here's a 50 centimeter boulder that rolled down the hill, similar to the one Brian showed. And then some older landslides, uh, their head scarps were reactivated and there was some recent fracturing along them. That's the main effects that, that we saw. Um, so uh, I just wanted to put this summary slide in here and then I'll show a quick thing about the clearinghouse. So the Slinkard Valley Fault is not really studied, but it has some nice tectonic geomorphology shown along here, these vegetation liniments. These colored lines up here are just the kind of the extent of the reconnaissance from the north. And then the recon groups were in the south a little bit, but this zone in here has some nice scarps in um, alluvium. So uh, indication that larger earthquakes are definitely possible on this structure. Um, and I uh, just wanted to reiterate that the Antelope Valley and the Slinkart Valley faults together basically play a significant role in producing the Sierra Nevada relief, um, causing basin development, as well as accommodating some of the plate boundary shear. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show is the Nevada uh, Earthquake Clearinghouse. This is the website. The website is shown down below if you want to check it out. This was funded by the Nevada De um, Department of Emergency Management, Nevada Department of Public Safety, but basically it was operational during the Antelope Valley earthquake and we were able to um, test it out during the earthquake. It includes lots of links for exercises that have happened, like um, scenarios, studies, and things like that, training manuals, lots of resources, and earthquake event pages. So, so far in there, we have the Wells earthquake, the Monte Cristo Range earthquake, and Antelope Valley. And if you go to Antelope Valley, there's a summary of the, of the, of the event, and then a list of all the data that I was showing, the track lines from the various investigators, their photographs, and you can download KMZs. And there's also a photo gallery with some, um, with some captions. So the earthquake, the, the website's here. That's all I have. Thanks for your attention. Um, my email is on the uh, first slide. Happy to take any questions there. Uh, you can send me directly, but please go check out the earthquake clearinghouse. It's a work in progress, but we're happy to be able to test it on the Antelope Valley earthquake. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, great to hear about uh, everything that uh, the University of Nevada takes care of and, and watching earthquakes and, and tracking the effects of them. Uh, next, we have uh, Richard Henniger from uh, Caltrans, who's going to tell us about uh, their response to the earthquake and their program for monitoring and following up on earthquakes. Richard? Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Richard Henniger. I'm from Caltrans, and I'm uh, thankful for you guys to let me come and speak to you guys a little bit about the Little Antelope Valley earthquake and how Peckett team is involved with that. 
So um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is some of our divisions within Caltrans. These are not all of the divisions that would be involved after an earthquake, but these are the ones that I'm going to be talking about today. So basically under um, in Caltrans, there's a division of maintenance. There's also a division of engineering services. Um, and the ones that you want to be, the, the ones that you're, I'm going to focus in on are the ones in red. This is structures maintenance. Their objective is to, uh, is emergency response, safety and restoration of traffic. So they concentrate on getting traffic restored and going. Um, our objective in the PECIT team is to investigate why things have happened and what happened to the structures and how we can improve. And I'm part of that team based on the drone team. The UAS stands is, is a drone. That's what a UAS means. The purpose of the PECA team after a large earthquake, earthquake the post-earthquake investigation team under the Division of Engineering Services gathers field information about the performance of bridges and highway structures. And using this information evaluates Caltrans current seismic design code and retrofit procedures. So basically here's the PECA process. Prior to the event, we prep by um, buying equipment, studying manuals, learning how what things we're looking for after an earthquake. And then once that earthquake comes, we're notified by a notifier on our cell phones called ShakeCast. And if there is any quakes after five point uh, that are larger than 5.0, uh, the first question that comes to our mind is: Is there structural damage? If there is no damage, and we've concluded there is no damage, the packet work is complete. If there is damage, the PECIT members are, are contacted and they form PECIT teams and they make assignments. We also coordinate with structures maintenance investigations and structures construction. We go out to the field, conduct inspections, and then we send daily reports to the Office of Earthquake Engineering, which is in Sacramento. And we write up PECIT report and then we approve that, uh, that PECIT report is approved. And then it's distributed throughout the subcommittees to analyze to see if we have to change some of our seismic design criteria items and some of our uh, uh, seismic design codes. The past major activities that PECIT's been involved with is the San Fernando Valley earthquake, uh, which was magnitude 6.6. Um, that was the first impl implementation of PECIT. And the cable restrainers, the, the products that came from that investigation were cable and strain restrainers for, retro, for a retrofit and also some, some column confinement. Then in 1989, the Whittier Narrows earthquake, which was a magnitude of 5.9, that was really when we really went into depth on the column retrofit program, and that was initiated then. Then we went to the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which was a magnitude 6.9. This is the Cypress viaduct, which collapsed on the lower deck. And uh, the, the main, the, the largest thing we got out of this quake was uh, connection details. We pretty much revamped the connection details and the specs on, on the connections. And then in 1994, um, we had a magnitude earthquake of 6.7. This is Gavin Canyon. And the, um, the product that we came from Peckett from this, doing this was frame balancing content, concept where we balance the frames, adjacent frames, so that we wouldn't cause some major damage on some frames and nothing on the others. And then we had um, the 2014 South Napa earthquake, which was a six magnitude 6.0. And then the 2019 Ridgecrest magnitude of 7.1. Now these were large quakes, but uh, kind of in rural areas, a lot, not a lot of construction out there, not a lot of buildings and, and bridges out there. So uh, really not a lot of um, uh, damage to, to see of. And then obviously the recent activity is the Little, Little Antelope Valley earthquake. In this uh, regard, in this area, basically um, we had a lot of uh, rock slides was the most uh, 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 prolific part of it. And um, basically there was some damage. I think there was a couple of cars that got hit, but no, uh, no injuries and no loss of life. And you can see this and you've seen this in the other presentations of the uh, rock slides or rock falls that they call that you guys call it. And then also um, here's uh, some of the map of some of the aftershocks that we, uh, we took just after the, the quake. Um, the reason for the PECA deployment for the um, Little Antelope Valley earthquake is uh, we wanted to check potential structural damage. We also um, 
planned with structures maintenance investigations to inspect five structures. Now those are five bridges. Now between those five bridges on the 395 and the 108, there was also a lot of uh, culverts. So we still inspected quite more than that. But um, basically five larger structures, but not too large. Um, we had a training opportunity to deploy the PECIT UAS team or the drone team for the first time. Now the drone team we had been uh, practicing, but we'd never really implemented any uh, uh, cases or any missions because uh, there wasn't any big enough quakes to, to do that since we've, when, since we've created the drone team. So um, we joined uh, the sm &I inspection team and went and inspected. Um, the PECIT team basically consists of seven Part 107 licensed pilots. That means you're commercially rated. You have to take a test and uh, you have to pass and uh, do well on it. And then basically there's four representatives from structure, Structures Design, three from Office of Earthquake Engineering, and two from Structures Construction. We have 12 drones. Nine drones are working drones and then three are training drones. Each drone is equip, equipped with extra batteries, carry-on cases, and many other accessories. Each pilot is assessed one drone so they have kind of a, a sense of the ownership so that the drones are well maintained. Each working drone has a 1080p and a 4k capability on the cameras. Here's basically our drones. They're all from, they're all from DJI. That's a very common uh, drone in the drone in industry. We have three Phantom 4 Pro 2s. They are kind of our flagship. They're a little bigger. They're best in wind. They also have the best camera. Then we also have a Mavic Pro 2, uh, Mavic 2 Pro that um, is kind of in between the size of this one and the smaller ones. Um, so it's a little better in wind, it's more compact and has a better camera. Then we have um, three Mini 2s. They, these are working, also working UASs. Um, they're best in tight areas and great. Uh, they have a, still have a great camera, 4K and 1080p, but they're less stable in the wind. And then we have three training drones. These are the Mavic Minis. These are the brothers to these ones. And uh, they're good cameras, but they're less stable in the wind. The potential bridges that we've uh, looked at were ones on Route 108 and 395. The Route 108 actually um, intersects the 395. And then there's a maintenance facility right next to it at that intersection. But there's uh, these kind of these bridges that are named. Uh, you can take a look at those a little bit later. But basically, these are the bridges that we were concerned with. So the procedure of the Peckett team after uh, the LAV uh, seismic event, uh, the Peckett management team corresponded by text to assess the earthquake. Then based on the size and location of the earthquake, past earthquakes and news stories, uh, there was minimal structural damage was anticipated. It was decided that deployment of the inspection teams was not necessary. However, decision was made to deploy the drone team. So for the first time, as a training exercise, uh, we went out there. We were already planning on a training exercise anyway to go out there. So uh, I was notified and I uh, called one of my pilots and we went out there the very next day after. So uh, on July 9th, I think is what it is. Um, the drone batteries, we went, to the, we went to the office, drone batteries were charged, drone equipment was gathered. The PEC coordinator, which is Bob Tanaka, uh, corresponded with Structures Maintenance who were planning a trip to the area. Then we had the assistant coordinator printed out maps for the inspected area and the drone pilots met the SMI engineers at the maintenance station near the earthquake and the bridges along Route 108 and 395 were inspected. Uh, problems though, there was no cell phone service near the bridges, so the team could not research the airspace above the bridges and the drones would not have any GPS service. Now we have always had the policy that we would not go to any earthquake uh, damaged area until we knew, till, till we knew that we had cell phone service and that we had um, a, a good idea of what the airspace uh, requirements or the air, the law of the airspace, FAA rules of airspace was around there. But in this case, we just left because of an exercise. So when we got down there, we discovered there was a marine warfare mountain training facility, which is right here, and it's uh, it's basically uh, has a small airport. So because of that there's a uh, zone in there where it's permission required. So even the drones wouldn't work because of that. So here's the 395 and here's the 108 coming up. And so we had, even though this line boundary shows that 395 is out of that, it's not actually true. It's actually over the 395 because our drones, we would go along this area and try to find um, uh, the, the structures. And every time we just check our drones and they would never work. 
and um, obviously we didn't have uh, coverage either. The drone team decided to drive further northward along 395, inspecting bridges along the way, and then checking the drones as a deep bridge to monitor when they would, when we would have permission to fly. Because remember, we don't have any kind of uh, area of restriction restriction on our on our phones to see when when we would go um, uh, to to which uh, bridge would be available. All the bridges were restricted except a bridge in Walker called um, Mill Creek Bridge. And this was actually the only bridge of interest because the shake cast, according to shake cast, that was the one that might show some damage. So we took our- we're uh, to 10 minutes. Great. So we took our mini twos and drove over to Mill Creek Bridge. And when we went there, the inspector, the inspecting engineer said, hey, you don't want to go to Mill Creek Bridge because um, there's too much vegetation. You won't have any access to either end. Well, here's the bridge right here. This over under the 395 and here's the vegetation. In actuality, there's actually more vegetation than this. This is kind of an older picture. But what we did is we put our camera, where our drone on top of the barrier rail. And then we just took it off about a foot and then flew over about two feet and went down into this little hole, which is about two foot in diameter, and we took this picture. And from that picture, we saw that uh, uh, there was no damage. And then we went to the south side and did the same thing. And you can see we also took an aerial view of us uh, from the top. So lessons learned from the LAV inspection. Make sure that we keep our protocol and our, our policy of studying the airspace and the cell phone coverage of the area prior to leaving the Sacramento office. Uh, also to have a point man at the Sacramento office that is trained in airspace restrictions so he knows airspace and guidelines and um, uh, also UAS restrictions as well. Make sure each pilot is properly equipped to do their job, including paper charts of the airspace area so that in case we don't have any uh, uh, data from our phone. Also implement the procedure from DJI to unlock the geo zone and eliminate the permission to require to fly restriction. Um, that's in an emergency case, we're able to do that legally. Um, so the summary, the Peckett uh, UAS drone team was deployed. There were several technical challenges, lack of phone coverage, restricted military airspace, drone geozone lockup. But uh, these critically important challenges were corrected, were understood and corrected. Um, the pros of, of the drone usage definitely outweigh the cons. Um, and the predicted advantages of flying the UAS for PECIT inspections were recognized. So basically we had only had predictions of this. There was never anything that we have actually tested because there were no quakes since the uh, uh, drone team was formed. So we really recognized a lot of advantages to uh, the, pr the predictions of, of drone flying. So um, a lot of potential for the use of drones. Basically it's safer, it's faster, and it's cheaper. And thank you. And there's my email if you need to, to uh, ask, ask any questions. Thank you, Richard. We uh, wish to, th to thank all of the uh, speakers for uh, taking time today and their respective organizations, um, the California Geological Survey, the US Geological Survey, the uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology, and uh, CalFrance each of our speakers. And uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, the recordings will be available. Elizabeth will tell you about that in a minute. And uh, you can find the email addresses if you didn't get them today. And you can send follow-up questions to each of the speakers then. And with that, I'm going to turn the uh, microphone back over to uh, the chapter president, Bolton, uh, for some closing words. Thank you, Donald. And I would like to uh, thank all of our speakers. It was very interesting. Uh, to see all of the uh, different aspects of this earthquake. And um, we will probably see you again uh, in the next earthquake. And I would like to hand the microphone to Elizabeth for closing remarks. Great, thank you. Um, let me just share my screen again. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to all of our speakers for those great presentations and to Volkan, Bruce Maison and Donald Wells for organizing and moderating. Uh, we'll be sending around a post webinar survey by email. We'd really appreciate it if you could respond to that. That helps us uh, create better events that are in line with your interests. If you want to learn more about ERI, you can do that at our website and you can also join us there. Um, 
To find out about upcoming webinars, you can read and subscribe to the Pulse newsletter, which is listed there. And we shared earlier the Northern California chapter mailing list. Finally, I just want to thank uh, FEMA for helping financially support these webinars and also ER, ERI members whose support also makes events like this possible. Thanks for attending.